Well, good day to you all. Thank you for joining me for Thursdays with Tim. It is, of course, today, Thursday, last day of January. I can't believe how fast time is flying. And um, special shout out to my wife, Virginia. It's her birthday. So she um, she's celebrating her big day. And it would be amazing if every one of you watching this right now could either text or call her and just wish her happy birthday. Her number is 585-86-75309. So just uh, once again, call or text Virginia and say happy birthday. She would appreciate it, she'd appreciate it, she'd love it, I would too. And her number is 585-867-5309. Love you guys. Thank you very much. And let's 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 dig in. Today we're talking about farming. Um, more specifically, three aspects to every successful farmer. And I have a lot of family that's farmers. I am by no means a professional farmer, but I do love to garden and grow all kinds of plants, trees, you name it, vegetables, I mean everything, and I've been doing it a long time. Um, and so I do have quite a bit of knowledge in this area, and it's amazing how much the Bible speaks about it as well. Um, before we get going, if you wouldn't mind subscribing to um, this channel or this podcast, liking, sharing, everything, take a picture, share it. We'd love that. That way the message gets out. Um, and anyways, if you haven't been, please check out our actual website um, or you know our channel, which is The River at O-C-N-Y Church. That is our actual YouTube and Facebook channel, and we'd appreciate that. Let's pray. Lord, bless us. Amen. All right. Awesome. We're good to go now. I'm very excited to be sharing this with you. Um, I know that the first message we talked about several weeks ago was my favorite hobby, which is hunting, and why I love being out there in nature, but also I do truly love spending that time with the Lord and seeking Him in those quiet times. This is my second favorite hobby. Um, more of a lifestyle, really. I truly love with all my heart um, every aspect that comes with uh, farming, whether it's planting seed, whether it's uh, pruning plants, growing plants, watering them, you know, transplanting them, and of course the best time of year, which is harvest time. Uh, and there's so much that goes into it. And the three main aspects that every successful farmer has to have, and this is profound, believe me, I know, this is going to be like this, boom, mind bomb that just went off. You got to plant seed, you got to grow weed and prune the seed when it turns into a plant, and then you got to harvest the fruit or the vegetable or whatever it is you're, you're growing and producing. And those are the three steps. So there you go. You are now all successful farmers, um, obviously. There's a whole lot of know-how and experience in that. I spend so much time picking my cousin, Michael Broadwell's brain on apple farming. Um, he, he runs an apple farm um, called uh, apple farm called Riverview Farms. It's my Aunt Renee and Uncle Jim's old farm. And they're just amazing. And I love picking all their brains on how they select the, the different varieties of apple they produce, what, what they use as a... Uh, pesticides, you name it. I mean, there's so many aspects to it and they're a wealth of knowledge. And last night, as I was sitting in my bed, I kind of got this point where I was like, man, I don't know what I want to share about tomorrow. I was just drawing a blank. We had an amazing Bible study or house of joy here and people were getting touched by God. And I'm sitting there in my bed. It must have been probably right around midnight, maybe, maybe 12, 15. And as I'm sitting there, it just hits me out of nowhere, I've ne I'd never thought of this. I'm, I'm, I'm laying there and I just think to myself, why do I love discipling Christians so much? Like what, what, a lot of people love to go and get someone saved um, or, or they, they love to just go out and even just give the attempt and share the gospel with someone, whether they receive Christ or not. They don't care, they just love going out there and doing that. And then there's the people that do the in-between work that love discipling, that take someone from a, um, who's never heard of Jesus to after they've received Jesus, now they're taking them through the Bible, teaching them the, the do's and don'ts of Christianity. And that is truly my passion. And as I was laying in bed, it hit me why I love doing that. It's because my my second biggest passion in, the nat in my natural life is growing 
pruning and taking care of plants. I have, if I were to turn this camera to look out this window right now, you would see about 54 blueberry shrubs, hundreds of raspberry and blackberry plants on trellises and all kinds of stuff, elderberries, I mean, you name it, grapes, we have all of it. And I love taking care of them because the more you take care of them, the better the harvest is in the summer and fall. Uh, so today, to kind of take us through the spiritual aspect of a farmer, I want to first talk to you a little more about the natural thing a farmer has to do. So a farmer has to decide, A, where am I going to plant my crop? Is it going to be an orchard, a vineyard? Is it going to be a field of cabbage, you know, field of corn, whatever it is? And then once they have the spot chosen, they have to prepare the soil. Um, whether it's, you know, plowing, disking and everything and making it, you know, perfectly flat and having it tiled so that the water doesn't just sit there and pool up, you know, it's going to leak off and, and not, not puddle up on them. And then you have to select which variety of plant you're going to use. You select them, you, then you have to spread the seed plant the seed in the ground, and then take care of the plant as it is growing, which is a lot of work. You would think that the biggest work would be, you know, getting the ground prepared. And if you're, you know, tearing down a woods to plant a field there, yeah, that is a lot of work. But the real bulk of the work comes with getting rid of the weeds, making sure that plant is growing well, keeping it disease-free, making sure it's reaching, getting enough sunlight and enough water and nutrients. Once it grows, then you're taking care of the fruit as it's developing, and then finally, the best part of the whole process, you get to partake or sell that fruit and vegetable and whatever it is you're growing. Um, to kind of put this into spiritual terms, a lot of you have heard what I'm gonna, gonna preach, but I don't think there's one thing that Lord showed me about harvesting your fruit that really just kind of blew me away this morning as I was preparing for this. But let me start with seed. So go with me to Luke chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, and then verses 11 through 15. Once again, go with me to Luke chapter 8. I am your Faja. Verses 5 through 8. Sorry, can't help myself when I say the name Luke. Brings me back to watching Star Wars. Luke chapter 8, verses 5 through 8 goes, A farmer went out to plant his seed, and as he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on the footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell upon rocks. It began to grow, but the seed soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. And then other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. And still the last seed fell on fertile soil, and this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. And when he said this, he called out, anyone with ears to ear should listen and understand. The disciples, of course, hear Jesus teaching this, and they ask him, hey, tell me in plain English, what are you talking about, Jesus? So Jesus answers with verses 11 through 15. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message, only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they believe it for a while, and then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares, riches, pleasures, and distractions of this life, and so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. So there you have the first aspect of a farmer, planting seed. Some, uh, and this basically is the act of spreading the gospel as all of us are called to do. The word of God says, go ye, as in all of you reading the gospel, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Um, and so all of us are supposed to be planting seed at all times, whether that's uh, when you're pulled up at a gas station or someone across at the other side. Say, hey, you know, has anyone ever told you God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? And you share the gospel with them. Or it could mean family members. It could mean crowds of people and you grab a bullhorn and, hey, everyone, listen up right now. There's an emergency. Let me tell you about God. He loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. However it is, you're casting seed. 
some of that seed is going to immediately result in a wonderful harvest of people getting saved, coming to Christ. Others, they may say the prayer and then they get distracted, taken out. They don't make it into a good church, whatever it is. Then others, they may not... They may reject you totally. They may, you know, slam the door in your face, they may, whatever it is. And then others, of course, they're going to hear it. Um, they're going to take it. And then eventually um, temptation from the enemy may take them out. So it's not up to us what happens. What's up to us is simply sharing the gospel, spreading the seed, knowing by faith that much of that seed is going to land on that good soil and it's going to produce everlasting fruit. So now go with me to the second aspect of a farmer. The pruning of plants in chapter 15 in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so that they will produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches, and those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask of anything that you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great joy and glory to my father. This is, this is what... If I could, oh, if I could like wrap my life mission into a nutshell, this is what it is. It is to take, it's to take a branch from, I'm not going to speak in metaphorical terms, I'm just talking spiritual terms. It's to take someone who receives Jesus and then take them through the word of God. Show them where they can find the truths in the word, what they should be studying, how to overcome the areas in their life that are distracting and tempting them away from God, and then show them how to build their life in faith uh, by hearing the word, by studying the word, by entering into God's presence, by letting the fire of God fall in their lives. That is where I feel called as a Christian mostly, whereas an evangelist would feel much more led to be throwing seed everywhere they go. And that's amazing. And there are times when, when I will flow in that, um, get in that office as well. But at the same time, I feel led to teach and preach and prune people into the likeness of God. And that takes time. It's dirty work. It's being down in the trenches. It's talking about things that people are dealing with that are ugly and keeping your heart right the whole time. But that is what true believers need to be doing. We are to be creating disciples. And to make a disciple, it takes pruning. Pruning hurts. When, when I first, um, a perfect example of this, I, I've had apple trees, and when I didn't know how to prune apple trees, they did not produce good fruit. I would go in, I wouldn't take off enough limbs, I would leave suckers hanging up, and the next year there wouldn't be much fruit. And so finally, um, my dad and um, I forgot who else it was, they kind of taught me, you've got to trim off more of the tree. You know, instead of just taking, you know, 10% off of the, the growth of the tree, you know, take 20, 30% off, and then you're going to be left with much more sun reaching those buds so that they can grow into better fruit and apples. And so with, with Christians, it's the same way. You have to be a fruit inspector. Your job as a Christian is to literally be a fruit inspector, where you're taking someone who is just starting maybe to bear fruit and saying, you know what? I see that this area of your life is not producing fruit, but this area is. So let's trim off this branch. It's useless. It's not creating anything good. As a matter of fact, that branch is causing disease to spread to the rest of the tree. Let's cut it off. 
And you watch as these people grow in their walk with God. It's incredible. They, they go from cussing like a sailor, watching anything on TV, not filtering anything, to the to a year goes by, and you're looking at them, it's like, man, have you been saved your whole life? You act like a born-again Christian has for after 10 years of serving the Lord. And that's what a discipler does. And you have to be able to know that the potential in every believer is sky's the limit. You can't look at them and see, oh man, all those branches, man, they've, they've got so much disease. I think I'm just gonna let this tree just go. You never give up. You trim off, you trim off, and then you help the strong parts grow. So I really love it, and I apply this to you know my blueberry plants, uh, my raspberry canes. You have to prune them. There's certain times of the year when you do more than others, and then you have to know how much of the plant to take off. What are the strong parts? What are the weak parts? And that takes a lot of work. So this obviously, if I were to ask you what part of a farmer's job takes the most time and dedication, it is the growing, weeding, and pruning of the plant. But the end result is such a better harvest. And in the end, as a farmer, the more harvest you have, the more money you make. And in the kingdom, the more people that you have producing good fruit, the more bountiful the harvest which leads me to the harvest time. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, the first gospel, first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. Now this is what the Lord spoke to me about this verse. Many times as Christians, we think that the harvest season or the harvest time that this, this is referring to is when you're just going out soul winning and people are coming to Christ. You're having an altar call at church and you know half the church comes forward. And that truly is an amazing harvest. What the Lord spoke to me about is what was coined continual harvest. And continual harvest comes this way. When you take a young man or woman and you help them to receive Christ in their heart, or you're, you're there after they receive Christ in their heart, and you disciple them, and you grow them, and you help them through the trials of life, they begin to now multiply and produce fruit. So that one fruit that, like, if I were going out, let's just say doing street evangelism, and I lead, let's just say, the low-hanging fruit, the easy ones, I got 10 people to pray with me. That was like picking the low, easy fruit off an apple tree. But now, the ones that got saved and they begin to be discipled and they get into a good church home and someone starts pouring into their lives, just like everyone needs to be doing, discipling someone, then they produce the fruit and multiply it on their own. So now you go from saving 10 people from, from hell to now they are reaching their families and their friends and multiplying. And by the end of it, you go from praying with 10 people to receive the Lord to a continual harvest of those 10 people praying with you know, several people a week. And before you know it, hundreds and thousands are coming to the Lord. That is the design of the gospel. That's continual harvest. That's going from taking, you know, you go to a, a football game, let's just say, high school football game, you, go, you ask for the loudspeaker and you preach to it at halftime and a hundred people raise their hands and they all shout and you know praise the Lord and they come in the kingdom of heaven. That is incredible. That is an amazing miracle to watch happen. Now imagine if all 100 people are discipled, they grow in the things of the Lord, they begin sharing the gospel with others. You just went from watching 100 people get saved to now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds getting saved that you're not even aware of. And this is the plan that Pastor Rodney has right now where he's going around the world seeing 300 cities just doing a meeting in 300 cities of the world and lighting upper room fires where he's going in, preaching the gospel and saying, who here is discipled and able to take this gospel to their friends, families, neighborhoods, places of work. And in the end, 
all those people are multiplying so quickly what one man could do in one meeting, they're now doing perpetually and continually throughout the year, throughout the rest of their life. And that's the plan of the gospel. So my encouragement to you is know, first of all, your role in the kingdom of heaven. You are a farmer. And we're all going to have times of planting seed, of growing, weeding, and pruning those seeds. And then, of course, we're going to have amazing times of harvesting the fruit of those seeds. And I need you to join me in taking on the mantle of doing the hard work of pruning, growing, and weeding those plants. Because it's what, it's what so many people don't want to do. Oh, I don't have time to disciple that person. I don't have time to invest in that person. The time that you have where you're just sitting on your phone, the time where you're just watching TV, you know, I'll bet if I took a stopwatch and I only pl clicked it every single time you were doing nothing or bored or, out, you know, just putzing around, I guarantee you, you would be shocked at the amount of time you have at the end of the week. That's all time you can give to simply reaching out to someone, contacting them, hey, praying for you, is there anything going on I can pray with? You know, and people open up. And it's our job to make ourselves available as brothers and sisters in Christ to help our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, our family members to grow from receiving the gift of salvation to becoming mature, fruit-producing plants in the kingdom of God. So I was, I'm glad the Lord put this on my heart because I always loved farming, I always loved growing plants, and I can see how in my walk as a pastor, it's so similar to what I'm doing every day, which is spending time pouring into people and maturing their faith so that when the enemy comes after them, they don't fall down like in a windstorm. When a hailstorm comes at them, those plants strengthen from the roots down and they're not going to bend and fall over and break. They're going to stand up to the storm and they will be there when the morning comes. And that's what, you know, we are called to do is go into the world preach the gospel, and make disciples of all nations. So, praise the Lord. I have preached myself happy. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I love you. I'm so thankful for all of you watching, and so thankful that many of you share these videos um, so that more people can get, you know, touched by the word that God's put in my heart, and that I pray touches your heart as well. So, enjoy the rest of your Thursday, uh, your evening, and have a great weekend coming up. God bless you.